the events producer. We're just so happy you came out tonight with all the cold and everything. So we're thrilled to see all of your faces. Um, we have a really fun event tonight, I think. Um, celebrating Andrea Chapin's first novel, The Tutor. Uh, and with her, James Shapiro, um, who's going to be interviewing and having a chat about uh, her writing process and Shakespeare and inspiration and all that great stuff. Um, I'm not going to read their bios because you have them on your chairs. Just so you know, we have a lot of fantastic events coming up this spring. Um, so if you want to go to centerforfiction.org and look up our events, you'll see the whole list with the description. So hopefully we will see you again in the near future. Um, Andrea's going to come up and read for a little bit. There will be a discussion between her and James. Afterwards, we'll open it up to a Q&A with the audience. Um, following that, we will be selling both of their books in the back and they will also be graciously signing them, and we'll have wine as well. So please stick around for all of that. Um, so without further ado, Andrew Chu. Um, I, I want to thank the Center for Fiction. Uh, it's very exciting for me and Maureen for, for uh, having us here. I have sat where you're sitting for many events here, many wonderful events. So it is particularly thrilling for me to stand up in front of you on this side. So uh, thank you. And I also want to thank James Shapiro, who's going to be sitting up there with me. Uh, the book, my book, uh, Noreen said, talk about the genesis of your book. And, and that is a pleasure to talk about because it, there's something very circular about tonight. Uh, it, it being in conversation with, with Jim, um, before I knew him and could call him Jim, I, uh, I, there was one Thanksgiving where my, one of my in-laws who's in the theater world said over Turkey, everyone in the theater world's reading this book, you have to read it, it's so amazing. And, and we had this whole discussion and it was A Year in the Life of William Shakespeare, 1599, and I thought it sounded really interesting and um, it was a point in my life where I was writing personal essays but hadn't been writing my own fiction for a while and um, I was editing everyone else's fiction and lots of it and I was at that point reading four books a month to uh, review for more magazine and also uh, on the jury for the New York Public Literary Lions Award which meant I got a big box of about 45 novels of writers under 35 to read and, and judge, and, and I was well over 35 at that point. Anyway, Christmas comes, I'm madly getting books at the Astor Place Barnes & Noble, which no longer is, and I'm heading towards the reception area, and I see A Year in the Life of Shakespeare in paperback, and I remember the discussion at Thanksgiving, and um, I grab it. And this is true, I wrap it up, and I put it under our Christmas tree, and we didn't have any place to go that Christmas, so I said, this is gonna be my present to myself, and everyone who is in the publishing, writing <clears throat> uh, world knows what deadlines are like, and, and teachers also, and, and papers to correct hanging over your head, uh, for me, it was manuscripts to edit, uh, reviews to write, and I said, I'm going to take this day and read this book. So I read the book. I didn't read it all in one day, but it was reading Jim's book that gave me the idea to write this book. Uh, it, it's an amazing book, and, and in it, I encountered for the first time, just because I hadn't really read about it before, the, the lost years of Shakespeare, these years, so many of his years that are undocumented. I had at that point been editing historical novels and reviewing them for more. So it, it was not, a, I, I never knew that I was going to be a historical novelist. And, um, but I was taken by this idea of the lost years of Shakespeare's life being the perfect terrain for a fiction writer to create a story for what he was doing. And, and the years that I'm talking about there are many lost years and many uh, undocumented years of his life, but the ones that I became interested in were 1585 to 1592. So I, I, I had this idea in my head and I was trying to think of who was going to tell the story and what the story would be. 
there are many hypotheses as to what he was doing at that during those years. 1585 is when his two twins are christened, so there's documents in the local church. 1592, there's a wonderful quip by Robert Green in a penny pamphlet that talks about him being a, um, well, we assume that he's talking about Shakespeare. He talks about the only shake scene in the, in the country. And, and to paraphrase the quote, he's, he says, here's this guy who thinks he knows he can do everything. He can be a, a, a player and a, and a playwright. And who is he really? Who's this, you know, it's sort of a, a real put down. And so um, I chose the year 1590 and before Shakespeare's ever mentioned in London. And I decided to take one of the ideas that he possibly was a, recu um, a, a tutor and part-time player and or part-time player actor for a recusant Catholic family in Lancashire. And uh, I did what Shakespeare has done in some of his plays. I sort of merged time around a little bit. And um, they think because of a, of a will in the de Houghton family, which is a family that still exists and still lives in Houghton Tower in Lancashire, that it was when he was around 15 that he might have gone north with uh, someone who had been the head of his grammar school. And it, it coincides with the time when his father, for whatever reason, loses his position in town and you sense that things are unraveling for whatever reason. Is it because he is a Catholic, the father? Is it because he is a youth, he's being fined for money lending at 25, 20 to 25%? Or is it be anything else? Is he sick? Is he an alcoholic? We don't know. So, so the idea is, in the one of the hypotheses, is that at 15 he goes north. I decided that he did go north at 15 mm -hmm. in Lancashire, and that then... He went back to Stratford, this is where fiction is fun, and that he marries, has children, and in, in my mind, and in my story in the Tudor, he's been in London, he's been a player, he's been touring, he's worked around in the theaters, and that he has come to, he's returned to Lancashire and um, to finish his first poem. So I'm going to read one scene for you. And, just, um, and to give you a little background, it's, it's chapter three. So um, my book, the themes running through it are, uh, it, it opens with the murder of a priest on, on the, the Delisle's property. Uh, and it's the Delisle's secret priest, which is families who still practice Catholicism, which was against the law, would have secret chapels and secret priests. And I've made their secret priest his day job is their tutor. So he's murdered in the first couple pages, just to get it good and gory, and um, uh, someone has come to replace him uh, and as the tutor for the, to teach the young boys. And, and just a few things that have happened in the pages before what I'm going to begin to read. Um, just so you know, uh, the old chapel... Oh, and they had to do these with Catholic chapels. The walls were whitewashed. Um, all the paintings, the religious paintings, were whitewashed. And in many chapels, for instance, in churches, they had to take out the stained glass windows. But um, in my mind, the stained glass windows still exist in, in this particular chapel, that the family's chapel. And um, but it's been turned in. They've since created a hidden chapel in this large house. Uh, but they and they've turned the old chapel into a schoolhouse because it, there's an extended and rather large and sort of I tried to make it Shakespearean family that inhabits this house and my protagonist Catherine is a little bit of an outsider. She is she was an orphan. Her parents and her brother and sister perished in a fire. Her sir, her uncle Sir Edward took her on into the, the estate called Lufenwall, and um, she was married off at 18 to someone more than twice her age. He died within two years. His sons, of course, got all his property. At 20, she lands back at Lufenwall and has been there since, and she's 31. And um, I'll start. <clears throat> Catherine sat on a stone bench in the orchard, mopped her brow with a kerchief and swatted at flies. 
netted center an umbrella from Italy, but the mid hour, the midday hour was sultry, and the pigskin no shield for the pounding heat. Was this unnatural summer an augury? More death, more destruction? Would the drought be followed by forty days and forty nights of rain? She plucked a gnarled apple from a low branch and pitched it at a pear tree. The day before, she'd taken the children down for a dip in the water that wound through the 3,000-acre estate, only to discover the river had shrunk to a trickle. As she lifted her skirts above her ankles to let in air, she heard the strumming of a lute and singing. When I was a bachelor, I, let, I had a married life, but now I'm a married man and I'm troubled with a wife. She rose and walked toward the music's source. High-pitched laughter rang through the air and cries for another master, another. The old chapel door was open. Catherine paused at the threshold and peered in. None of the boys were seated at the table. Their horn books were dormant, their quills likely dry. A stack of books lay unopened on the old pulpit. The boys had gathered round the balladeer, who was standing with one foot on a bench and a lute in his arms. Six-year-old Robert, Ursula and Richard's youngest son, had climbed onto the table and was dancing to the hoots and hollers of his kin. The rude fellow she'd found lying on a wooden table now tipped his head at her and smiled. She'd run into him a few days before. It's a scene you've missed. He plays with her verbally, appraises her as though she's a horse, a very beautiful horse, but a horse, and then when she asks who he is, he says that he's a horse trader from Warwickshire. Well, she's about to find out that he isn't a horse trader from Warwickshire. The rude fellow she found lying on the wooden table now tipped his head at her and smiled, but did not put down his instrument. He shoved his foot from the bench and started walking around the room, embarking on another tune. If ever I marry, I'll marry a maid. To marry a widow, I'm sore afraid, for maids they are simple and never will grutch but whittles full off as they say no too much. He stepped this way and that in what looked like a jig. A maid ne'er complaineth, do what so you will, but what you mean well, a widow takes ill. A widow will make you a drudge and a slave, and cost ne'er so much, she will ever go brave. Catherine, as we know, is a widow. Catherine snapped her umbrella shut and marched through the door. He bowed so low, his knee almost touched the floor. What is this? she demanded. Why, to school, madam. You are the new tutor, he bowed again. I meant, what may I call you? A rogue, a rascal, I pray not a knave or a cur, the boys tittered. Your name! Will Shakespeare, he bowed once more. We met. You tutored me on a breed of horse that can never be mounted. I did nothing of the sort, Catherine said, wondering if the steward quib was responsible for hiring this jester, who seemed to mock her with every bow. Forgive me, a breed of horse that can never be broken. Master Shakespeare, you dissemble, not of the equestrian trade as you led me, led me to believe, but a lesson monger. She shook her head, looking directly into his moss-colored eyes, and continued in a voice not quite her own. Is this what lessons are now? Pipers and fiddlers and filthies? No pipers here, milady, and filthies, well, these hours are for you to teach these precious young minds Latin, Greek, and mathematics, not to regale them with your musical cunning. The orders issued me were that these precious young gentlemen must sing their part sure and at first sight and be able to play the same on a viol or lute. And these ditties will suffice? Madam, next you'll catalog dancing a plague and piping a pox. Singing is a knowledge easily taught and quickly learned where there is a good master and an apt scholar. The exercise is delightful to nature and good to preserve the health of man. The better the voice, the better tis to honor and service God therewith. Whom God loves not, the man loves not music. I see no music sheets here, Catherine said, sounding much the sheriff even to herself. Tis here, my good Minerva. Shakespeare tapped his temple. When I was a child, I lived music. I did not have to learn it. The barber in our town drew teeth, bound wounds, let blood, cut hair, trimmed, washed, and shaved. But a lute and a citter hung on his walls, and Virginal stood in the corner of his shop. Every day I went and played, while the other poor sots sat in their chairs and brayed. Catherine glared at him. He seemed to be awaiting a response to his little speech. 
and not getting one, he paraded on. I crave your pardon, my lady. Time passes and we must launch into Latin. For if we do not, then you'll have to sit through several rounds of hey, nani, nani, nose, and perchance even a sing willow, willow, willow. Shakespeare hung the lute on a peg on the whitewashed wall. Back to the benches, you louts. Little Robert hopped down from the table and Master Shakespeare picked up the leather-bound books from his pulpit turned lectern. Come, my gentle jade, now that you have charged into my school, why not graze in the pasture of the ancients and regale us with your learning? Her cheeks flushed. Her eyes were fixed. His eyes were fixed on her. They had changed color, seemed a lighter green now, like fresh grass. Art thou cunning in Latin, he asked. Catherine nodded. The children were staring at her. She was trapped in this man's volubility. My good Minerva was one thing, but my gentle jade was an utter insult. Shakespeare held up a dark brown leather book with gold tooling on the cover and down the spine. William Lilly's lovely short introduction to Latin grammar, which always seemed to me too long. Amo, amas, amat. He put the book down on the pulpit without opening it and then held up another book, Sententiae Pueriles. I pray, madam, you approve of this volume? No ditties here, I assure you. He placed Sententiae Pueriles on top of Lily's grammar book. Catherine had studied both books. Ah, oh, but my heart is tender for this. He held up a book. Ovid, pray, my patroness of heavenly harmony, be seated. My patroness of heavenly harmony? From where did he pluck these words? He had a calling, surely, not of a schoolmaster, but a court fool. He rifled through the pages of a worn copy of Ovid, muttering, uh, we might read this, or this, or the, aha, uh, that, yes, this, Pygmalion. He addressed his pupils. I will read the Latin, repeat after me, then try to pen its equivalent in English. Those who are not as proficient, try a word or two you recognize. Then he turned to Catherine. Will you join us, my lady? No, Gramercy. My, my duties at the hall await me. He bowed again and began. <clears throat> Quasquia pigmelii ivum per crimen agentes. Catherine started to leave. When he finished the fourth line, she stopped, turned, and translated out loud what he'd read. Pygmalion had witnessed the wicked ways of women and disgusted by their sinful and deceitful nature, offended by their shameful conduct, their life of vice, he had forsworn all woman, women. She glowered at the tutor. Ah, a lesson in the wantonness of womankind. Was this an order issued you as well, Master Shakespeare, she asked, and not waiting for his response, she trotted out the door. After supper, she hunted down Ovid's metamorphosis in the library. She hadn't read Pygmalion in years. With two candles lit, she read the original Latin, Pygmalion takes no wife. To pass the time, he carves a maid out of ivory. His skill is so great, when he kisses the statue, it seems to kiss him back. He fears that if he holds her hard, there will be bruises where his hands have been. He caresses her, whispers words of love, and lavishes her with gifts. He drapes her with rich robes and gives her rings with fine gems. He hangs pearls from her ears and sets her on his couch, her head on feather cushions. At the feast of Venus, Pygmalion prays at the goddess's altar, and Venus hears and understands him. He has wished for a wife of flesh like his maid of ivory. A flame leaps forth from Venus's altar three times, darting high into the air. He races home and kisses his ivory lover. Under his lips, there's warmth. He puts his mouth to hers again and touches her breast. The ivory becomes soft, the wax beneath the sun, like wax beneath the sun. With his hand, he satisfies his wishes again and again. Her pulse throbs under his thumb. He presses his mouth to the maid's lips, to the maid's, lips on lips. She blushes, then raises her timid eyes to him. The words warmed Catherine right down to her very loins, and she worried the tale was too lewd a conceit for young boys with the kissing and the touching again and again, the hard ivory turning into pliant flesh. Pygmalion was surely a lesson of Eros with all its tantalizing passion. But the new tutor seemed determined to shock and to make his mark at every occasion. By the time Catherine replaced the book on the shelf and made her way to her chamber, the grand house was dark and mostly quiet, though she could hear singing and laughter from down in the buttery 
or maybe from out in the barns. that chapter and uh, I love the book. I should say that I had a chance to read it in early versions and it got stronger and deeper and richer and one of the real pleasures of reading this book, if you know something about Shakespeare, is how deeply it reaches into uh, the corners and nooks and crannies of what we do know about Shakespeare. And probably what I love most about this is the poem at the heart of, of this book, which is Venus and Adonis. And it's, uh, it's not something we teach ordinarily when we lecture on Shakespeare. Has anybody here read Venus and Adonis? It was the Fifty Shades. It was the Fifty Shades of Grey of the 1590s, and it sold as well. Went through ten editions in the first decade in which it was written, and uh, it's the most, one of the most erotic poems of the of the period. Uh, Thomas Middleton, a younger playwright, has a character walk on and talk about Marlowe's hero and Leander and Venus and Adonis, and he calls them two luscious marry bone pies for a young married wife, which is basically <laughs> softcore pornography. Uh, and it's an amazing poem. And you really create a story around the making of the poem. I'd love for you to talk about that a little bit. Uh, well, can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay. okay. Um, I, I, I had my idea that, that Catherine and Will would work on a poem. Uh, I didn't know what poem, and, and I, I first had them working on some sonnets. I, I immersed myself in the sonnets very heavily. And then I encountered his two narrative poems, and like the few straggling arms in this room, I had not read them. I had read the sonnets years ago, but I had not read either Venus and Adonis or The Rape of Lucrece, which he published six months after. Venus and Adonis, and um, uh, I was just completely in a swoon uh, uh, about the, the poem because it was so friggin' sexy, and and it, again and again and again. I mean, it it it, and Shakespeare does something very interesting with this poem that it, Venus and Adonis has a myth that has been, had been touched upon by other writers, and in his his way. He takes it and and turns things upside down. If you want to sort of go into that, or sure, yeah. Why don't you describe? Okay. I mean, well, this is the great conceit of the poem. He he takes a poem where we have the gorgeous goddess, and she sees this mortal who's pretty hunky himself, thus an Adonis, and um, and in other uh, incarnations, it. Um, there, there, there was, um, she wanted to try to seduce him, but what Shakespeare does is he really makes her, he almost switches roles, he makes her a little more, ma sort of like a classic masculine role. She goes after him, I mean, she becomes a huntress. She is, and, and he, he, Adonis is often described in, in very feminine terms, um, his skin and, and, and his, his lips are described again and again and again. I, I did count, I can't remember, but the word lips appears like 20 something times. And and kissing, there's tons of kissing. There's lots of, they almost get it to it and then they don't and he's very coy or something happens or she pretends to fall in a faint. So there's a lot of almost and then not quite get, so it's, it keeps you on your toes. You're like, when are they gonna get to it? Um, so, I, I said, there's, there's my poem. Um, and I did sit with that poem. I, I really got underneath. I mean, I pulled it apart, I, it, it, I, word by word, um, 
sentence by sentence to look at it. And also what I found is as I developed the two characters and, and what happens is it sort of it becomes a Venus and Adonis story between Will and, and Catherine, is that when I would get, and I, this is one of the magical things about often about writing, when I would get stuck about what to do next with them, I would go back to the poem. Mm -hmm. And that the poem would then, I go, okay, I would get my bearings in the poem, and then I would create a scene. So anyway, that was an interesting. I mean, what, 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 what's great about this novel is it's about the making of a poem. And every poem has a history and a story, even as we're sitting up here and talking about mm -hmm. the history and story of your, of your novel. But we don't know the history and story of this poem. And, and what the tutor does is provide for me a persuasive and plausible, if completely <laughs> fictional, <laughs> backstory to how does a young guy, and she didn't really care about this poem. He, he didn't care about publishing his plays, but he went to a friend of his, Richard Field, and he had this printed beautifully in London. It's probably the only thing he cared about his first, as this is your first work, that was his first work. And it mattered. But it's really a perverse poem <laughs> about a young guy and an older woman. And we know Shakespeare married a woman who was probably seven years older than he was. And we presume that... Uh, you know, he slept with as many people as he could, as, 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 as many who can do. And, uh, and he must have been an extraordinary flirt. And what, so the pleasure of reading this book is the mutual illumination of, of a poem and a relationship and a novel as the three Mm -hmm. really keep clarifying each other. Instead of teasing you as Adonis teases Venus, I'll read you one stanza from this so that you don't think we're making up how hot this stuff is. <laughs> and this is about 500 lines into the poem and uh, she's getting a little tired of his failure to, uh, to react to the the love goddess that she is. And she's already kind of picked him up and put her on her <laughs> arm and carried him. You know, there's a lot of funny stuff in there, but this, this is that Fifty Shades of Grey moment. Um, she's finally got him down. He's tripped, falling backwards, and she jumps on him. Hot, faint, and weary with her hard embracing, like a, a wild bird being tamed with too much handling. Or is the fleet-footed roe that's tired of a chasing? Or like the forward infant still with dandling, he now obeys and now no more resisteth while she takes all she can, not all she listeth. And it goes on and on. So back to how does Shakespeare in your novel write this poem? Uh, he um, he <coughs> engages this widow. She's pretty hot herself, uh, and he engages her in the creative process with him. And um, he senses that she. To give a little background, at, at, in Elizabeth, Elizabethan times, women, uh, aristocratic women, might know how to read and write, and they might not. Um, there was no, and, 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 and Shakespeare got, we assume, went to the grammar school in Stratford. Uh, it was an all-male grammar school. And, and so uh, if a woman, there's a wonderful book by Jermaine Greer called Shakespeare's Wife. Wife. And she really gives it a, a wonderful background as to what, 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 you, what, you might, what a woman might know and might not know, and how she might be educated or not educated. And if she were taken under, a, an aristocrat, aristocratic woman were taken under the wing of a, of a priest or a father or an uncle, she might be taught. But it was, it was unusual. So I have my Catherine, uh, when she returns um, after her older husband has died, and, and sort of reckons that she will 
not remarry, which is actually very unusual for those times. They didn't have, well, her, uh, Queen Elizabeth's father, yes, divorced, but it wasn't a usual thing to divorce, but people died, so you could have two or three or four husbands and wives. It worked out quite well that way. Um, and so people remarried, usually they remarried twice or three times. It was, it was, it was a, a, because someone died off. So she pretty much puts her foot down that she's not going to remarry. And, and at one point, and I fictionalize um, a dinner where she remembers this, where Sir Philip Sidney has come, is passing through and has come to, um, to Lufenwall, and she's just lost a, a third child, um, uh, miscarried. And she, he's, he's a few years older than she is. He comes through, he was a, he was a nobleman and a poet, and uh, he died young with a, a musket shot in his leg, and I think he had one of the biggest state funerals that ever was. It was a, he was he was massively um, he had a big following, let's put it that way. And um, so she remembers listening to him that night and listening to him talk about poetry and she decides that she will read, that that will be her she, that's what she's going to do. And and it, it, hopefully Sir Edward, her, her uncle, has an incredible library. Um, so um, she's well read She's really smart, and Shakespeare seizes upon this well-read, smart woman and realizes, consciously or unconsciously, well, I, 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 I feel it's consciously, uh, that she will be the, the, the path to him writing and finishing this poem. And that, um, so that's, that's they, so they embark on this. At first she thinks he's just appalling, and then he's very seductive. And she becomes extremely involved in the process of writing the poem. And to a point where she's not sure where the lines really of the character that they are creating, where she stops and the character begins. So, um, I, so I have a lot of fun with that. Yeah, and what's great about it also is uh, we tend to at least in the classroom, idealized Shakespeare. But he was a writer. And anybody who lives with a writer or is a writer knows that uh, writers chew up everybody in their vicinity. And uh, people are material. Yeah. And uh, to write a great poem, somebody's going to suffer. Uh, or a great novel. But we're not going to get into that. Uh, and I don't write novels, so I don't worry about that. But that's one of the really exciting... I mean, at the heart of the story is not just the creation of a poem, but uh, the consequences for the two people involved. Yeah. And this is, of course, Shakespeare before he's broken through. He's an actor, he is a budding playwright, but he hasn't made his mark. And it is with this poem, really, that he lands uh, and becomes a best-selling writer yeah. uh, in addition to everything else. One of the things that um, I love about this, we, we were upstairs <coughs> in, the, in the green room uh, complaining, as, as writers do, about um, book designers and how we can never get covers exactly the way we imagine them. Of course, they wouldn't sell if they were exactly as we imagine them. But this book happens to have a brilliant, brilliant, brilliant cover. And I, you know, I, I remember this picture well because um, I've studied it in the National Portrait Gallery and worked on a documentary uh, that included this. But this has been photoshopped, and I want you to explain <laughs> that before I explain the cover. Uh, only that when we did decide on this cover, okay, this is, I, this is, this is what I told Jim before we, so I have to tell you, is that in those days, um, basically the, the dress went right down to the top of the nipple. So in this portrait, you could basically just, and I just thought, <coughs> I kept looking at it and I'm like, oh, I could, so I made them Photoshop the dress up just a little bit so it covers, so there's no nipple showing. So that's, that's the truth behind this <laughs> The woman in this extraordinary painting, uh, and I know about this because it's, 
she's on the first page of a book I have coming out next fall, and I know her story quite well. And uh, she would have been the greatest reader, both of Shakespeare's poem and this novel, <laughs> which she would have read. The short and long of it, not to tease you, is her name was Frances Howard, and she was married off at the age of 15 in a really bad political marriage to the son of the now dead Earl of Essex. And uh, teenage marriage wasn't really approved of in England. It was done for political purposes. And the young man was shipped off to the continent for three years. Um, he was clearly gay, uninterested in women. And when he came back, uh, couldn't get it up for her. And she was probably the most beautiful young woman in England. And here she was, stuck. And uh, she was an extraordinary presence. And there was a trial in which he had to uh, uh, argue that he wasn't impotent, that he could get it up. And when he was hanging out with his friends, they could swear that he was able to get an uh, although she swore equally. And uh, she took matters into her own hands. She had her own doctors swear that she was still a virgin. And they were able to get the marriage annulled. And uh, she married uh, a dashing young man. Unfortunately, they killed somebody who was opposing their marriage. And they, she and her new husband ended up in prison. It was a complicated story. <laughs> but she was, again, an example of untethered female sexuality which we don't talk about when we talk about the Elizabethan age, which is what you talk about in this, in this relationship, especially with widows who were imagined to be, in a Shakespeare's teething, teasing Catherine in the chapter you just read to us, uh, in the way that the stereotype of the, uh, uh, the widow's uh, rampant sexuality. So I think you capture a lot of social history in this, and I think you capture... Um, uh, a lot of the mystery of the stuff that scholars can't explain, which is uh, how did these great works, especially this poem, get written? Well, it, it's, um, it was so fascinating for me, and to, to and, and Jim knows much more than I do about this, but to look, we don't know a lot about Shakespeare, but what we do know is is fascinating, and and that you can find a lot in in that, and you can, um, and people have asked me how did I characterize him the way that I have, which is is not Shakespeare in love, um, and uh, I looked at the facts, and the facts are that he has a a very ambitious father, and that it that. Uh, he's, his father's not just a glover. His father um, married up. Mary Arden was from the class up. His uh, John Shakespeare's parents worked on, on on Mary's parents' land. He leaves farming, goes into Stratford, starts making gloves. Correct me if I'm wrong on any of this, but this is what it's, and um, by the time he marries Mary, he's already bought two houses. Um, he does things not just making gloves, he, he deals in wool. Wool was a gigantic and very, very important uh, commodity. And um, he also is a money lender. Uh, and um, he then starts taking positions in the town of Stratford. And by the time Shakespeare is around 14 or 15, he's, he's equivalent to the mayor of Stratford. So when people say, how can Shakespeare be Shakespeare? I said, look at his father. He came from a very ambitious father. I don't know if his father could read or write, but he was very ambitious. He could at least put his stampers or his initials on, on documents. And he applied for a coat of arms and did not get it. Um, and that, so I took that idea of, 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 and something happens when Shakespeare's around 15 where the father tumbles down, as I as it's mentioned before. So I took that idea of a son who's grown up with this father who's rising um, and he tumbles and the son probably, this is in my vision, would have gone, was a really smart son and would have gone on to a scholarship at Oxford or Cambridge as they did have at that point. Um, Christopher Marlowe's father was from equally humble background and he got a, a, 
a scholarship at Cambridge. But if, if the father tumbles and can no longer make money and the 15-year-old has to go make money, uh, can't go to maybe where his, his mother or, and or father wanted him to you know, university. Um, and how, um, in my mind then, he, he sees an ambitious father, he is very ambitious himself, and he, he wants to get places. I mean, Shakespeare didn't just settle for being a player, and didn't just settle for being a playwright. He made sure that he, like his father, who made, you know, who, who made sure he had a percentage of in money, when in money lending, a cut, and a cut with the wool dealing, Shakespeare made sure he had a cut of every ticket that, that was bought. And um, he bought the biggest house in Stratford when he had made enough money. He applied for a coat of arms, the same coat of arms that his father wanted, and he got it when he, because he was already well known at that point. So I had fun looking at his, looking at him as being an extremely, extremely ambitious person, of someone who was so ambitious, maybe because he didn't get to go to college, university, that he will use people to get to where he wants to go. And, and so he, he's, I, I had fun playing around with that. I also had read a lot about Picasso and, and I read Francois Gillot's memoir about what it was like being married to him and, and how he used over and over again uh, uh, muses and, and abused them and often destroyed them. So in the back of my mind, too, I, I put a tiny little bit of Picasso in there. So uh, anyway. Let me ask you one yeah. more question, then we'll open it up to questions from the audience. Uh, Catherine is what we might describe, although there was no role for this, uh, or nothing like this in Shakespeare's day, uh, essentially a book doctor. <laughs> uh, and uh, I was wondering to what extent uh, your imaginative capacity to imagine what it's like to be a book doctor. Um, <laughs> Influenced my how I wrote the character. Yeah, that's my question. Um, it, 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 heavily. And I, um, it, I, it, it, to me it gave an emotional, emotional resonance to Catherine and, and to how she got very involved in, this, in, this, in the writing of this poem. Um, at that point, I didn't have a novel that I was working on, and so um, I have been known in my in my book doctoring to get, and this is why I love it, and I still do it. I get very involved in the pro project. I um, and it, uh, so I used that type of um, uh, response to writing, into language, into plot, the way I respond to it when I edit someone's book. Um, I had Catherine respond to, to, to Shakespeare's words and language and plot that way, so she gets very involved. She does, and she's a very good book doctor. And I hope in the next work she gets to write her own novel. <laughs> um, let's open it up to questions. Please. I'm, I love the double entendre of the title, and I just wanted to know when that occurred to you? Uh, it, 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 it's even, in my mind, it's about a quadruple entendre. Uh -huh. Because who ultimately is the tutor? There's a lot of, and, and I'm not going to give it away, but, but at the very end, I think the tutor is not someone who you initially would think it would be in the beginning. It's someone we haven't even discussed here tonight. Um, I want to not give away too much. <laughs> exactly. Um, but I play. I, I was very much was playing around with who's tutoring who on what, and it so it goes back and forth. And yeah. Any yeah. other? Next question, please. When you, I know you've edited many other people's books. When you edit your own work, especially a book, not a short form thing, are you able? Do you edit quickly? In other words, do you sort of like write and chop, chop, chop? Maybe that day, that week, or do you sort of? Get big pieces out and then go back and edit. I will just say that Jim Shapiro read my first draft, and that was about 300 more pages than this book is now. I, my sister read my first draft too. Um, so um, I will say the first draft was very long winded in a lot of ways. I fell in love in this particular book. I, I edit, when I write shorter pieces, I edit them pretty quickly. But with this book, I had that uh, fortune, misfortune of 
falling in love with Elizabethan verse and falling in love with Ovid. So I had to put, there was so much more Ovid in the initial book. I had so much of the Fairy Queen in there. You could, you know, just just acres, leaves of, if of the poem, that. If the poem was lost, it could have been salvaged <laughs> from that first draft. <laughs> It was, it was an incredible learning experience for me. I've been on the other side persuading people to do a, a second draft and a third draft to keep at it. It's going to get there. Just keep, you got to keep going. And so when it, when I had to do it, it was, it was really horrifying initially. And then, and then I actually, at one point, I just, I, I it was very conscious. I, I knew that I had to cut a lot, and especially from the beginning of the book. And I sat down one day and I said, okay, you are going to, it was, I, it was almost like I could feel myself put my other hat on. I said, you are going to just separate yourself from this as the writer and you're going to edit this. And it was so conscious. I had to almost talk to myself out loud. So it was a pretty conscious process for me. For that. And it was very expert. I mean, I got to read a, a second draft of... <clears throat> Yeah. Was tight. And then I had an amazing editor, Riverhead. Let me say that. That 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 what the what after the book was sold, that some of the drafts I'm talking about was pre-selling. Um, I had Megan Lynch, who's now um, at, at Echo, did was was really right on the money with with Wonderful. I have to say, she's great. So I know a good editor, and she's a great one. Mm -hmm. so. Please. Could you say something about the history of getting this book published? Where you started from, and was it easy, hard, how many rejections, the, you know, the, the ugly the, stuff? The, the grit, the grit, I'll, I'll tell you, it's, um, uh, I, my agent, this is part of the editing, goes, goes to the other question, my aide, we all felt like it was a pretty, like there was a big possibility, and she sent it out initially to a small group of editors just to get the sort of just to see, I mean, I think seven, or somewhere between five and seven. And they were all pretty much down the line extremely enthusiastic and immediately bumped it up to the next level, which is very positive. And they were like, oh my God, it's going to the group decision. And then it, it didn't get taken on uh, out of those seven. And so that's when I had to really talk to myself. I thought, okay. It needs another big round, and um, <coughs> I sent it at that point to a lot of different friends of mine, and, and said, "Okay, be brutal, you know, read this." So, and then I I took it in and um, did a, a another major edit, and then it went out and was preempted in a week. Mm -hmm. So it, it shows that the process is not often what you think it is, you know. But then if you do the work, hopefully it gets there. So. It had to do, it had to be edited one more time before it could before they would immediately seize on it. So, any other? In the back. It's an interesting time to be doing historical fiction. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we had Simon Shama in the Financial Times, basically in a fit of I think uh, my reading is jealousy, uh, going out after Hilary Mantel because she's not a historian at all. <laughs> Who's a fiction writer who write historical fiction? You know, there's a lot of. I mean, his take on what she did was that she basically made a choice about how to interpret the period, and the Tudor period has got you know, endless choices to be made. Mm -hmm. Do you have a sense of, of making choices yourself? I mean, was, was Shakespeare a secret Catholic? Was he not a secret Catholic? Um, um, you know, was he period? gay? Was he not gay? Yeah. Like all these questions, yeah. which are <laughs> interesting. Um, and in my mind. I did make choices. It's it's almost like what a, a, a actor has to do when they're going on stage and they have to make choices about their characters. That they they are creating those choices. Why does this character react this way? What what does this character have in their pocket? What what is you know they're creating the motivation for these lines. So I had to do to do that. And um, in my mind, Shakespeare did come from a Catholic family. Uh, but then again, that's a dicey question because the national religion changed like four times in 40 years. So everyone had been a Catholic, and then everyone had been a, a Protestant, and then everyone had been a Catholic, and then everyone had been a Protestant again. So, so anyway, um, in, in my, I decided that he was of the ambitious sort that, and he, there's a line when, Catholic, when, when the house has just been raided, um, the state has just been raided by 
um, the local sheriff to try to find a secret priest. Um, and Catherine, and they, they, they would tear houses apart. I mean, there's wonderful actual firsthand um, research describing this. <clears throat> and um, some, some of the research is from the priests who were hiding and would hear the people up above the floorboards. And they would be executed if they had been found, for the most part, many of them. But anyway, um, so in, in my mind, and I have this in a scene, she says, well, what's, which side are you on? Because it's a very Catholic household that he's teaching in, that he's a tutor in. And he's, he, he says, he, he talks about a, a cousin of his, it was an Arden, who was um, arrested and, and horribly um, tortured and, and drawn and quartered and hung, and, and his wife was for being Catholic. And he, he said he witnessed that going on in his family, and he decided early on that he was he was gonna he wasn't gonna play the, the religion game basically. So that he sort of a I, I have him as being not you know more interested in his writing and his ambition and and not taking sides as a Catholic or a Protestant. Um, and in terms of someone asked me recently, um, and it was an interesting question. Uh, about Shakespeare and homosexuality, which I think is probably fairly recent scholarship or questions, and, and we could talk a little more about this. I do have some hovering of um, bisexuality for Shakespeare, possibly in this in this book that you you will read if you haven't, and uh, several times. And um, I decided to let that hover. I, I wanted to imply that it might be possible, but. Um, uh, anyway, you have to read the book to find out. But I, but I did have to make those decisions. In my mind, Shakespeare was bisexual, like that. That that he was someone who, um, in the end, as some people who need a lot of worship and a lot of attention, fairly narcissistic people. It doesn't matter what gender, as long as you give it to me, sort of thing. I, in my mind, in the end, that's how I, that's how I agree. And just to, and just to weigh in as a non-fiction person in a house of fiction um, and as a cultural historian who deeply admires and is influenced by Shama. Any non-fiction writer who doesn't admit to being jealous of what a novelist can do is lying. You know, there's, there's a line and uh, we talk about Shakespeare's lost years. And there are biographers who, who are in the business of writing nonfiction, who are good friends of mine, who cross that line. Mm -hmm. We cannot enter that promised land, <laughs> and should not, because then we're doing fiction. And we don't do fiction as well as the Tudor or Hilary Mantel's novels. That's best left for those with real imaginative powers. So, Shama's got to be jealous. I'm reading this because I'm jealous. <laughs> Three more questions. Okay. Any other? Or even two before we sign copies, please. So, you think that Shakespeare wrote Shakespeare? Hmm. Do I think that Shakespeare wrote Shakespeare? <laughs> I know that Shakespeare wrote Shakespeare, but I know that there are smart people who think he didn't. People like Sigmund Freud or Mark Twain or Helen Keller. And uh, because I get a lot of time off teaching at a good school and uh, <laughs> lots of fellowships to fancy libraries and archives where I get to handle the materials related to Shakespeare, I took off five years and wrote a book called Contested Will. Uh, and um, it shows not only that Shakespeare wrote Shakespeare, but why smart people think dumb things. And uh, <laughs> anybody who's been to a meeting in the last week knows exactly what I'm talking about. Uh, the evidence is overwhelming, but some of the smartest people around have thought for really interesting reasons that Shakespeare could not have written Shakespeare. But this is one of these say it ain't so shoeless Joe moments. He wrote it and uh, I wrote a book so that high school and junior high school teachers everywhere, well, the smart aleck, the kid in the back of the class who said the Earl of Oxford wrote these plays, can simply say, 
spend five ninety nine and buy the paperback. <laughs> I've contested Will, and when you're done, come back. And um, that's my answer to that. But um, I don't have to answer that question much anymore, and I deliberately chose to have as my book in the back um, a book called Shakespeare in America, which includes some of the great writing, including by Mark Twain, about the fantasy that Shakespeare didn't write Shakespeare. But that's another kind of fiction. Yeah. We all want to invent a Shakespeare. Mm -hmm. And what's liberating about the Tudor is um, you're not writing nonfiction, although you are very careful with both political, social, and I should add religious history mm -hmm. as well. And I think it's the obligation of a good historical novelist to do so. It's not a thee and thou book. It's a book that situates you in a very fraught moment in the 15th 80s, 90s, and uh, that is the job of a good historical novelist. And you've done a good job. Uh, we're going to be in the back signing.